Genau. Ja. <lacht> ich glaube, jetzt haben wir alle. Hey, herzlichen, herzlich willkommen. Ähm, uns freut mich, dass es doch jetzt halb voll ist. Ähm, uns freut mich vor allen Dingen im Prinzip Markus Appenzeller begrüßen zu dürfen. Ähm, der, glaube ich, einen ziemlich spannenden Vortrag halten wird. Ich kenne Markus, ähm, ich glaube, wir haben im gleichen Uni studiert, allerdings unabhängig voneinander, das haben wir dann später festgestellt. Markus Appenzeller hat ähm, einen interessant, ziemlich interessanten Werdegang, sagen wir, einerseits aus dem Banking kommend, dann in die, in die Rechtswissenschaften und dann zur Architektur und inzwischen auch im Städtebau und zwischen diesen Disziplinen arbeitend. Ähm, hauptsächlich an der Uni Stuttgart studiert, glaube ich, und am IIT in Chicago. Ähm, und dann aber auch in verschiedensten Büros, einerseits bei Fink und Jocher in München gearbeitet, ähm, dann bei OMA, dann bei KCP und jetzt ähm, selbstständig ähm, ein Founder MLA Plus und leitet dieses Büro, unterrichtet an verschiedensten äh, Institutionen ähm, und bewegt sich eben genau an dieser Schnittstelle zwischen Architektur und Städtebau sehr viel im internationalen Raum und ich bin super gespannt, was er über in between erzählen wird. Ich habe lange sehr gerne mit ihm gearbeitet und auch immer noch und kann ihn auch als Freund bezeichnen. Das wird sicherlich spannend und bitte fragt, diskutiert nachher. Also in der kleinen Runde können wir das auf jeden Fall. Und ich glaube, es gibt ein paar ganz spannende Ansätze, die ihr auch wirklich dann wieder verwenden könnt in euren Arbeiten. Herzlich willkommen. Danke. Schön, dass du da bist. Und er wird auf Englisch vortragen weil er hauptsächlich auf Englisch spricht und es auf Englisch vorbereitet hat, Fragen, Q&A machen wir nachher auf Deutsch. Ja? Ja, das ist okay. Floss is yours. Ich kann es auch auf coming. Deutsch machen, aber ich, ich halte meine Vorträge fast alle auf Englisch Nein. und wenn ich dann irgendwie einen Vortrag auf Deutsch halten muss, dann komme ich mir immer total blöd vor, weil ich irgendwie, irgendwie wie so ein Amateur erstmal die Worte zusammensuchen muss. Deswegen mache ich es auf Englisch. Ja, um, yeah, um, well, um, when... Alma sent me, uh, Ute sent me a question um, as to um, uh, what I want to talk about. Um, you said, yeah, we're talking about public space uh, in, the, in the widest sense uh, of the word. And I thought, I'll uh, just take it from there, um, but um, did a bit more of an abstraction and just called it in between. Um, and um, that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, what you see here is basically what the in-between is. Yeah? So the in-between is actually, you know, um, that what is not buildings uh, in a way. And um, I want to actually highlight a bit and talk a bit about um, what that in-between actually is. Um, talk about a bit of a paradox um, that, that I feel is there. Um, an opportunity. Um, with that opportunity comes a challenge. And then um, I want to show you two projects that um, we did uh, with the office um, that could be a response. But I mean, that's not the only response. I think there is many more uh, one could uh, think about. Well, let's start with the paradox. Um, if you think about um, you know, what is the in-between and how does the in-between uh, uh, emerge, um, there's, of course, you, know, you could say the in-between is what is in-between Uh, the architecture. Uh, and that's, of course, if you look at medieval cities, that's very much how, um, yeah, how that in-between in these cities emerged. So they were kind of growing organically, and there was a need to basically organize uh, space, um, organize uh, a network in between, uh, in between buildings, uh, and that actually has become uh, the in-between. But then there's also another model, um, that the in-between is actually a result of infrastructural decisions. And as a matter of fact, most, most American cities, North or South American cities, actually, um, actually have that kind of in-between. And it's a different kind of in-between because the infrastructure from the start defined what the in-between is and the buildings came later. So it's a complete inversion of what, uh, what let's say, the, the, the sort of uh, medieval uh, or ancient model actually was. Of course, there are other in-betweens. Um, there is natural obstacles. This is a picture from Luxembourg, which has very deep valleys and trenches. And then, um, um, you know, the topography, whether that's rivers uh, or, um, or other obstacles actually form uh, the in-between. And the in-between becomes kind of a constraint to the development of a city. And lastly, um, we also have an in-between, which is simply the result of aesthetic decisions. So 
that Central Park is there is basically largely an aesthetic decision. We want a park here, and of course it has a functional reason, but um, it's, it's just, you know, there was no need to build a park here because it has no infrastructural, um, in the terms of hard infrastructural uh, role, and um, it also is not really an obstacle. So um, you have the aesthetic decision that are purely around beauty. Now, if you see that map, I think what's really interesting is and I did an analysis, you can do that online. So how much is gray and how much is actually black in that map? And it turns out that 64% is gray and 35% is actually black in this one. So you could say, you know, 60% of this one is actually, or more than 60% is actually buildings and uh, the rest is uh, the in-between. But that's not exactly true. Because if you zoom in, um, what you see in these blocks is that actually the amount of in-between is much, much bigger. Because what you saw before, you know, a block actually is just that thing that defines a block. But in reality, these blocks have, um, have holes, have gaps, have setbacks, uh, etc. So that even in the densest part of, uh, of Manhattan, uh, you see that, you know, you're getting very close to 50-50. If you go further out, that ratio, in a way, flips around, you know. So 60% um, in... Uh, um, um, on Long Island City actually becomes, uh, becomes uh, uh, open space. And if you go further out, that even gets more. So if you look at it then, almost everywhere in the world, and um, you know, man the center of Manhattan might be an exception. In Hong Kong, I guess you will also find places where there's less in between than uh, matter. But in most places, it's actually the other way around. And then you wonder, or I started wondering, you know, if usually more than 50% of our cities are actually not buildings, why is 90% of all the rules um, we're dealing with is referring to buildings? Why is that the case? Um, why do we so, so much focus on that? And we've done actually quite remarkable things. You know, there is, you know if you go to, uh, to New York, you have a super refined zoning envelope, and I was working on projects in New York, an architect cannot decipher these codes. You need a special expert consultant that explains to you how the zoning law in New York actually works. Um, so it's really, really complex. But, I mean, it's an enormous achievement to actually do something like that. Or, and this is from the Dutch context, um, and of course you have to have all sorts of tools all over, all over the world. Um, um, build quality plan. So that's like... Um, a plan that kind of makes uh, decisions on, on aesthetics, basically, of, uh, of buildings. Um, and, you know, it's all around buildings. It's all focusing on buildings. And I find that, you know, at least a question one can ask why that is the case. That's especially interesting when uh, you look at, you know, the challenges we're dealing with. So these are all the SDGs. And what you see in green is actually the SDGs that are directly affected or where uh, open space, green space, the in-between actually has a positive effect. And the orange is actually what really deals with, uh, with architecture to a smaller or larger extent. When it comes to you know, affordable and clean energy, you know, that could also be for, uh, for both. So the in-between is actually an enormous driver for, for, um, for um, a lot of the SDGs that we want to um, um, reach at some point in time. This is a warning, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons why we are so much focusing on, uh, on buildings, uh, that actually most of the urbanists uh, are suffering from a bit of an architectural bias, and that's also how most are actually socialized. You know, I'm, I'm trained as an architect, Ute is trained as an architect, many of you are sort of, uh, you know, have, have an architectural background, and um, that kind of makes us first and foremost focus on buildings on the built substance. That's what we learned. And then, you know, we go into urbanism. And a lot of offices that also do urbanism actually are architectural offices that do master planning. Um, and, I mean, I'm, I'm also teaching in, uh, in Amsterdam, and um, there it's, it's a bit different because we are actually are doing a lot of teaching together with landscape architects. And then you actually get a completely different focus. And I think that is, that is part of the problem that we are, we are facing, that actually um, you know, architecture has a very, very strong position in the definition of, namely, urban um, um, in-betweens. I think there is an enormous opportunity um, to 
actually deal with, uh, with a lot of challenges. And the in-between agenda is actually quite long. You know, this is what you could call the in-between agenda uh, that we have to deal with now. You know, it's about health. You know, everybody's talking about healthy, active lifestyles. It's about uh, new mobility. And then it's, I'm not only talking about, you know, the fact that we're kind of now having electric bikes and electric cars and all sorts of small and bigger uh, means to, uh, to move, but it's also, um, it also has, the, the new mobility also has an enormous impact on the public space. So electric cars, for example. Um, I haven't seen so many here, I have to say, when I, when I walked here, um, but when you go to the Netherlands or when you go to Norway, uh, then you know what I'm kind of talking about when, when you talk about electric cars. More and more of these charging stations are actually put on the sidewalk, on the street. And I think that's great because, you know, people can have electric cars. But there is also a problem that's associated to that. And that is when you park your Tesla there um, and you want to charge it at uh, sort of a decent speed, it actually sucks as much energy out of the power grid as 17 households. So that means, you know, if these 17 households all have a, have a, have a, a Tesla, you actually need an electric infrastructure that is about 300 times um, what, what you would need um, if you didn't have electric cars. And the problem is that, you know, they actually get really big. So the capacity is defined by the amount of electrons you can get through a cable, and that's defined by simply the, 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 the cross-section, the, the diameter of, uh, of these cables. And we're not talking these cables anymore, we're actually talking much, much bigger cables. And that is a big challenge because, you know, the streets are already full with all sorts of stuff and there's almost no space uh, to actually put these. And um, I had uh, a lawyer in a, in a lecture like two years ago at the academy and he said, I think it's always great that you guys are drawing all these nice street sections with all these charging stations. But believe me, how we solve this underground is a total uncharted territory. We don't know how to do this, and we don't have any tools to actually organize that space underneath the street, other than, you know, sort of a first come, first, come, first serve thing, um, um, and, and that is really, really a big problem. Of course, in between is about recreation. Um, we saw, um, you know, also what, uh, what Corona did, and that all by a sudden there was, you could almost say, sort of a renaissance or, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the in-between. Uh, energy generation is also um, a, a big thing um, because, you know, if we could move from, if we move from, from coal plants, gas plants, all sorts of centralized power plants to, um, to sustainable energy generation, then to a large extent what it needs is actually more space. So like PV cells to have the same capacity as an atomic power plant, you need a lot more space. Windmills need more space. So, that's also something that actually has to happen uh, in between. And of course we can do it outside the city, but um, it might also be a, a, a worth a thought to actually also keep that at least to a part uh, in the city. We need to increase our biodiversity, also a big challenge. How do we do that? Where do we actually, uh, um, you know, how do we make sure that species don't uh, uh, get extinct? And of course with climate change, a lot of uh, uh, species are actually uh, coming under increasing pressure. So we actually have to provide more, um, um, also possibility for them to find more pockets and to survive. Um, water retention. That's, um, in Holland, that's a huge problem um, because we already have a groundwater level that is just underneath the, underneath the, 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 the surface. Uh, but of course, that becomes a big issue in, in you know, all over Europe. I mean, we saw in Germany last year what can happen, um, and you know, this is only the start of, of, of what we're going to see more often. Air quality, we need to deal with that. We need to find uh, ways in, um, you know, kind of cleaning the air, um, and in between, space has a, has a big role in that. Urban heat, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. And then on top of that, we're also saying, yeah, we have to densify our cities, and that puts even more pressure on this uh, in this in between spaces. We always say, yeah, we have to put on top and uh, and and uh, uh, sort of um, densify within sort of existing structures. But in the end, you know, there is a sort of you always eat a bit away here and there, and all by a sudden, you know, it's all gone. So this is a really, really a big agenda that all these spaces actually have to deal with. Um, <coughs> at the moment, there is almost a sort of a bit of an in between overload. Um, so we're putting all of that 
onto the public space because it's easy, you know. Um, it's, uh, it's, um, it's public, so um, uh, it's not of me and it's not of uh, any other house owner. It's actually, you know, of all of us. So let's just uh, dump it there. Um, this is, the title says, uh, even in a city park, uh, it can be too busy um, um, uh, to, uh, to, you know, give each other the necessary uh, room. Leben und Leben lassen. On the other hand, you know, that is a challenge. The other is that we actually um, have to deal with climate change and we hear from the IPCC that we're actually moving too slow. Last week I read some article that said we should actually be moving five times faster to at least reach the two degree goal, not even talking about the one and a half degree uh, goal anymore. And this is, the effects are huge, you know, so now we're talking two degrees, but I mean, if you just see you know, what, uh, what the effect is between one and a half and two degrees and the amount of mitigation that we actually have to do to deal with these effects, um, that is, it's just, uh, it's just staggering. And if we keep, you know, if we move from two to three degrees, it gets even more. Uh, and, and in the end, we, we cannot kind of cope with it anymore and our cities become completely uh, uh, unlivable. But I think <coughs> we can do something about it. Um, and um, if I listen to politics, uh, a lot of policy makers, uh, there's of course big discussions around how can we uh, deal with climate change and you know, the market has to do it, we have to do it with buildings, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's all good and it's all important. But if we have to be quick and if we speed up things, then I think um, we have um, a great tool to actually um, at least you know, speed up the whole process because it's of all of us. And uh, Juan Cross once said, um, um, public space um, should be the container of public investment. And he was a former mayor of Barcelona and then later uh, the um, Secretary General of UN Habitat. Um, so sort of not the least of all uh, 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 people. Um, and I, I mean, I was there when he said that in uh, the Habitat 3 conference. And it, it, it was exactly in that context of, you know, if we need to change something in cities, then, you know, as a collective, let's use public space to do that. Because this is what, you know, cities have control. This is what we collectively have control over, represented through our public administrations. The mayors, the politicians that represent us actually have, you know, a high degree uh, uh, of control um, as to what happens there. But we can also use that, you know, to become you know, to, to kind of leapfrog, to get things going um, in, a, in, a, in a much, much uh, quicker way. And I think we should actually focus on that. So, <coughs> if we want to, by 2050, um, have our cities ready for a uh, two degree um, um, climate future, let's say, um, then um, we have to do something and we have to get going. The interesting thing is that on average public spaces um, get an overhaul every 20 to 30 years. That's a kind of a typical maintenance cycle for, for roads. In some countries it's, uh, it's a bit more, in other countries it's a bit, a, a bit less. Uh, depends also on the type of street, for example. Uh, in the Netherlands they have to do it more often because it's all sand and, uh, and um, um, you know, the road very quickly is not a road anymore, but more like, uh, you know, you, you can test, um, test drive your, uh, your um, SUV. Um, but 20 to 30 years is what we actually um, um, are looking at. Now, if we start now, actually creating something that is ready for the two degree future, then we're ready by 2050. But we have to start now. Because what I saw uh, is in front of our office in Rotterdam, um, they redid the street just like half a year ago. So everything was they dig, everything was digged open, they put like new pipes and new utilities and everything, and then they just put the surface to cover exactly the same way it was before. Now, great, the street is much better, but of course that's kind of just falling short of what it actually should do, and that is, in a way, thinking about what does it have to do uh, from now on in a future that actually looks different, and this is something that we're really, really struggling with. And that's actually where we, um, as an office, actually seeing this in front of our, our office, um, thought actually we, sh we should uh, uh, develop something uh, around that. So if we look at how the streets actually evolved um, and how especially regulations around streets evolved, 
um, it's, th there's also been a shifting focus. So, you know, from the emergence of the street to, let's say, the 1970s, um, there was really a focus on streets as transport infrastructure. So this is where all these, these design codes um, were actually uh, um, uh, defined. You know, so how wide does a carriageway have to be? What kind of radius? Uh, when do you need traffic lights? How big is an intersection? How big is a roundabout? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. All of this actually has been developed uh, in, that, uh, in that period of time. And then from around the 70s, 1970s, the you know, Club of Rome brought these limits of growth, and there was actually a moment where people also started kind of thinking a bit differently about, you know, what is actually our infrastructure? What is, uh, you know, how do we want to live in cities and what is important? Also, the car had basically, you know, killed a lot of city life. Um, so, there's, you know, people started actually demanding that um, the street actually becomes more of a public space so that the human being not sitting in a car actually has a place again uh, in the street. Um, and, yeah, somewhere, you know, I don't know when it started, um, but when this whole, with this whole climate change uh, discussion, of course, today streets should be doing more. They should also become uh, a climate change uh, agent. And um, for the first two, you know, we actually have, uh, we have a toolbox uh, that has been developed. Um, as I said, the, the, the engineering uh, handbooks for uh, street design, and then all these... Uh, design manuals that have been popping up pretty much in every city uh, around, uh, around the world on how to, you know, make sort of, you know, a kind of a lively, uh, very much human-centered space. So all these, these guidelines are really focusing on the human being and a bit green and a bit biodiversity, but not too much. But what's really missing is how can we, you know, sort of integrate that climate change challenge uh, into that. And I think that is really the challenge that we actually have to deal with. So in the end, all the street design guides that are there should actually be sort of revised. And we did sort of, uh, uh, with the office, we did uh, um, a little, let's say, test run for ourselves uh, just to develop our own uh, thinking and our own uh, methodology. And we, we are busy um, kind of creating um, sort of different volumes that are dealing with different kinds of apps, aspects, all dealing with this, uh, this climate change. So it, we gave it a sort of the title one and a half degrees, and it's about this is about streets, but there's also one about water bodies, and one about uh, parks, and one about um, buildings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's just a sort of largely internal document that we are uh, developing to, in a way, shape our own uh, thinking. Ultimately, it's about um, with all these changes, integrating sort of old and new uh, space demands. So the old space demands stay. You know, there's still people on the street. There is also different means of transport kind of coming around. Um, we have uh, utilities that are running in streets. So this is all going to stay. But it also changes. So, you know, um, we have the classical um, users of streets, uh, pedestrians, cyclists, cars, and trucks. But we always see now happening that, you know, already that kind of human-centered mobility is just becoming much, much broader. We have this sort of electric mobility of all sorts of, 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 all sorts of uh, uh, ways we are having, you know, uh, micro-mobility, uh, we're having different kinds of trucks, different sizes, so it gets actually much more colorful in a way that the streetscapes. And of course, if we want to take this serious, it's not just, move, not just humans that are going to move around, but also we to have this more, better uh, bio biodiversity, we also have to start thinking about other species that actually need to use, you know, that in-between space uh, for their own uh, movement. We have to think and really rethink also how we organize underground infrastructure. So far, this is like when you look on the street, it's all put next to each other. So you have the, the sewers, you have typically two kinds of sewers. So one is for black water, one is for uh, gray water. You have electricity, you have gas, you have, uh, what else do we have, telecommunications. Um, and uh, in some places you have district heating even, and, uh, and all of that is put next to each other, which means already now, it basically, the whole space underneath the street is already covered. Now when we talk about climate change mitigation, we also means that we actually need to, and heat island effects, we need to do something with uh, green. So how do we actually get green in? Trees have roots, and these roots need space. 
So we have to actually also sort of rethink how we deal with, uh, with infrastructure. Um, we have to start thinking more about biodiversity um, and not just green. So if you look at, and I had, lately I had a, had, was working with an ecologist instead of a landscape architect on a project. And it's really, really interesting because um, these people really tell you what is a good tree for a place, you know? And it's not about how the tree looks, but how many species actually can use that tree. And if you look at most places around the whole of Europe, um, typically the, the, the city trees are actually not the species that foster most of the biodiversity. Um, they're actually typically those that are even most have the, the lowest maintenance budgets. And that is also something that needs to be uh, reconsidered. And what also needs to be reconsidered is that we actually create continuous green grids in the cities. You know? So um, for all sorts of animals that they can, you know, basically that the city is not really an obstacle anymore, but they can actually, in a way, sort of float through that city uh, and make their city also part of their, their own habitat. I think we're also all demanding more interaction in the street. I mean, that is still going on, you know, from the 70s it started, but that's still a, a process that is going on, that we want to use the street more to, you know, meet, to do things, to, uh, to, to be. Um, Water retention uh, is, a big, uh, is a big issue. Um, how do we make sure that um, when there's enormous uh, extreme weather events that um, you know, we have enough uh, storage capacity and also the streets can play a role in that? Um, the heat reduction, of course, plays a role. And then <coughs> I think we also have to start thinking about you know, how do we actually do that? With what kind of materials do we do that? Um, can we not actually redesign streets in such a way that they eventually even become carbon sinks, or at least do not add more uh, to, uh, to um, um, our carbon uh, exhaust. I think ultimately what is needed is, um, um, like with buildings, that we actually develop kind of a, a code for designing streets. You know, in buildings we introduce zoning, and I think for streets we also uh, have to start looking into zoning. So in a way kind of creating parts, especially also underneath the street, uh, where certain things can happen and other things cannot happen. And we have to sort of comp compress them, condense them. This is in a way the sort of a five-step uh, method that we, uh, we developed for ourselves as to how we can actually approach that problem uh, of organizing and integrating all these things I was just, uh, was just mentioning. So it um, starts off with actually really an, an analysis, an urban analysis, and not just a single street, but actually analyzing on a, on a network scale, uh, at least on a district scale. Because what you see, and that's nice about, about most of the cities in Europe, is that they actually have networks of streets. So they don't have you know, the dead ends, and the, 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 in, Holland, in, in the Netherlands they are called Bloemkorweike, so cauliflower uh, 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 districts, where you have all dead ends with, uh, with, uh, with roundabout or turning, point, turning circles uh, in the end. That's not how a typical European city works. We have grids. And the nice thing about grid is that they're incredibly um, you know, flexible. So you can take out one street and the mobility, you can still kind of move around. And um, in this case, we said it's not about just you know, um, um, kind of taking this grid like it is in New York, that pretty much everything is the same but actually that we start differentiating in a grid what kind, of, uh, what kind of streets we have and then not understand the street anymore as just a transport artery, but also as part of that sort of climate mitigation, water management and biodiversity. And for that you actually need to go through uh, um, quite, a, quite an intense analysis of understanding, you know, what is this actually we're, we're dealing with and how do the bigger systems uh, work. And once you have that, you can actually start designing this. So um, this is an example in, uh, in, in, in Rotterdam, where we basically said, OK, there is a grid. But actually, not every street is, ne is necessary to actually have you know, a full load of cars there. Uh, you can actually you know, kind of focus uh, traffic on, uh, in certain places. You can turn some streets into you know, more of a linear park where a car can still drive to a front door but it's actually, it completely changes the character. And still you have, um, you still have, you know, the accessibility and reachability of every building. But of course, that also opens up the possibility to organize things in a different way. And um, 
when you do that on a systemic level, you can also start sort of analyzing, you know, what is the status quo, what do we, what do we have now? And if we change things uh, as we thought of, how would things improve? And of course, this is, there's a de degree of subjectivity to it, you know, but what, what we wanted to have here is just to understand, you know, does it get better or does it get worse? That was basically what it was about. And then, you know, does it get much better or does it get only a little better? That was, for the sake of our design um, uh, intent, that was uh, actually uh, sufficient. And if you take all these factors um, and you start actually um, sort of modeling them in, then you also see you know, that, that these streets also have different focal points. So you, know, you need streets, that you still need streets that are focusing on transport. But you can also have other streets that are focusing on biodiversity or they're focusing on water management. And I think in that way we can, we can sort of reread um, our entire um, city. Um, <coughs> but only once you've, you've kind of assessed that on the systemic level, uh, we then said, okay, now let's actually look at, um, at sort of designing the street section and the spaces around it. Um, and in that we also um, started, in a way, typing, you know, like we do with buildings, we have different typologies. Uh, we thought actually we should also develop, you know, typologies for, um, for the way we kind of make streets. So, this is really about um, focusing on mobility. So we said there is uh, something, let's call it organic mobility. That's basically, you know, walking and cycling, uh, slow traffic, um, uh, but also basically staying and being uh, in the street. Uh, there is the, the, the sort of active mobility, which uh, is focusing on cycling, um, small autonomous vehicles, maybe the one or the other car, a bit of delivery, that's all possible. And then, of course, you have the uh, the motorized mobility, which is really, you know, what the street is nowadays. But, you know, once you start kind of differentiating this more, actually it also becomes, um, immediately it becomes much richer than the whole, uh, the whole um, yeah, toolbox you actually have. <coughs> and then we, you know, w when you design it, of course that also always needs this kind of checking back, you know, is this, we did it on a larger scale, but we also wanted to do that or started doing that on a smaller scale. So street by street, we're actually sort of mapping out, um, you know, how that street would actually change for our own understanding. And in the last step, and I think that's always very important, is to actually visualize what the result is. Because ultimately, you know, we can make the nice plans, but we have to get people to, you know, to understand what is it about, and you have to get people engaged to actually, you know, we also embrace um, uh, a different kind of life. Because in the end, we know that, you know, everybody's kind of worried that the parking spot in front of their house is disappearing. Um, and that is something, of course, um, that will inevitably happen. On the other hand, you also have to show them what they actually get back. And maybe it's not such a, bad, such a big problem if the parking spot in front of your house is gone, if that's replaced by you know, a nice place where you can sit or where children can play, and the car is actually parked around the corner. So <coughs> we actually did this uh, in, in a case study in, uh, in Rotterdam. Um, it's, uh, uh, this is Rotterdam, and this is in the, uh, in the north of the river. I mean, most of, many of you actually have seen it. Um, it's uh, Schieweg, that's one of the main uh, well, arteries coming from the motorway um, going um, um, into the city center. Uh, and there we took uh, one quarter where we said, okay, let's look at this as a sort of an, an example. Um, also because it had the very different kinds of, uh, kinds of streets. So we have, for three streets, we actually really designed it. Uh, but we started off with, uh, with um, uh, again, you know, the analysis. What does it give us? Um, we looked at all kinds of aspects that, that had to, are related to transport, to water, to topography, to, uh, to um, shadow, um, to the green space networks that are there um, as a starting point. And then, um, in a way, designed sort of three different networks. So, starting off again with, uh, with you know, um, categorizing uh, the streets uh, differently and saying, okay, there is you know, the main roads um, that are important for the, for the mobility on a, on a city-wide level. Then you have internal ones, and then what you have in yellow here are actually just very local sort of uh, roads. And if you, you know, when you do this, uh, this space syntax analysis uh, and also have uh, car numbers, then you can actually very quickly uh, sort of find out where there's actually room for more or less greening. So, you know, a very busy road, that will be much more difficult to, to kind of 
you know, make, make fundamental greening changes, but if there's only very few cars going through a the street, then of course that is, uh, that is different. We looked at the biodiversity um, and um, especially also what green spaces are there and you know, what, where would it be important to actually link them up so it becomes uh, a network. Um, with water that was much more complicated because you know, of course topography plays a role in that. Um, and uh, um, in the Dutch context, of course, water is always, uh, um, you know, critical because, you know, we don't, here you have, I don't know where the groundwater level is here, but when it rains in Holland, normally the groundwater is just half a meter below the surface, and when it rains a lot, then very quickly everything gets actually flooded because there is already water so, so close to the ground. Uh, so that was, uh, that was um, um, also finding, you know, can we create spaces where we temporarily can store water? And they're not using a lot of technology, but actually the natural uh, topography for water to run into, uh, into certain places. And, you know, if this is the condition now, um, this would be, you know, a, a possible uh, condition uh, after. And <coughs> we did it, as I said, for, for a series of streets. I'm going to start with the, the smallest one. Um, um, that's um, um, a street that goes off the main street. Um, um, as you can see here, you know, in a way, a typical, yeah, kind of typical street in Rotterdam. You know, cars on both sides, sidewalks, um, 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 you know, a carriageway that is just wide enough for two cars to pass by, and then a bit of green, but not as a sort of a consistent, uh, consistent thing. Um, so we did that analysis and also identified, you know, where we see actually uh, potential for uh, improvement. And uh, if this is the section now that we have with, uh, you know, typically the sewer uh, in the middle of the street with a bit of green bicycle parking and, uh, and parking, um, this could be, you know, how it is in the future. So, in a way, condensing all this infrastructure into, um, you know, you could say utilities tunnels where that is in, um, creating that, that linear, um, yeah, this linear biodiversity uh, connector. Um, having not all water actually just running off into sewers, but actually having spaces that can store water and in a way also delay the, the, the water runoff. Because often the problem in Holland is that when it rains, then, and it rains a lot, that um, you know, just, just the, the, there's not enough, uh, simple, uh, simply not enough um, capacity to take the water off. So if you can delay that runoff, then actually your system can, can cope with it. But for that you need places where you can temporarily uh, um, uh, store it. And this could be uh, these places. And of course, there is also possibility for natural uh, infiltration. And over that, there is also more space emerging for you know, people to do things um, and eventually uh, sit on the street. So if this is the street now, we thought you know, this is how the street could look like uh, in the future. Um, and of course, when you see this, I think that evokes a completely different image. You know, what used to, we have, we're kind of all used to this, to, to sort of this kind of image, you know, of that is a street. But once you start actually um, sort of, you know, embracing that it could look different, then I think, you know, there's quite, um, you know, it has, it is certainly different and maybe you could say it's less urban, but that's also because we have this sort of preconception as to what an urban street actually is. Maybe this is actually, you know, our children might think that this is actually an urban street because this is where they grew up with. So we're all kind of carrying that our own, um, you know, history with us. And maybe we have to actually step over that and just go for, you know, also eventually a different aesthetic of, uh, of streetscapes in cities. The second street, um, um, same method. Um, here we have, um, we have it, it's slightly wider. Um, and here we also um, proposed um, you know, a, a different kind of street section. Um, what is here also included is sort of thinking about you know, how this new mobility can actually uh, find a place and how, how for example, also uh, distribution systems in cities change. So we all know about this, um, you know, this delivery vehicles that are sort of clogging our street everywhere. So that's what we also said. Maybe we actually need to include in our streets places where you know, they can basically sort of dump the packages that you're, you're kind of receiving um, and uh, do this in a much more efficient way, not always parking and just going to every front door, but actually having central uh, collection points. And for that, you can also make space uh, in that. In this case, um, 
the street actually has is bordering um, a a park um, that um, uh, and there we said actually you know um, it's not just the street but we also can start activating the public spaces around it and actually use them also as water retention uh, bodies in the future and this is basically a space that you know is wet when it's raining a lot but then it kind of dries out when uh, uh, over over time basically and then it can be also used in different ways the last one is um, really the street street, you know, the, what we would think, you know, the transport artery uh, where uh, all the cars go. And, um, and there we, um, yeah, so this is the existing section, it has also a tram running in the middle. Um, um, there is green, um, um, six lanes of traffic and then parking uh, and a bicycle path and uh, pedestrians. Um, and um, here we felt that you know, when you think about 2030, the other streets, they're just narrow enough so you would, you know, would overhaul them just in one go. And the traffic will not significantly change anymore. So there will still be people who will still have cars and drive around. So you need, that's what the street need to provide for. But for these main arteries, our um, expectation was that this is much more sort of a step thing. So um, we would start with, you know, just accepting that cars are there and public transport is there but actually just making that whole space um, better suitable for um, um, water retention and infiltration. So, for example, where the tram is running, nobody, I mean, typically trams, trams in Rotterdam are running either on a, a sort of a tiled surface or on grass, but it could also be just a basin because if you put tracks like on concrete um, structures and there is water around or not, it's not really such a such a big, uh, a big difference. So that is something you could also start activating again as, as water retention space. There needs to be also a bit more room for, for trees to grow um, if we want to have more trees and that's also what this uh, uh, provides for. So if this is what it looks like, um, we said okay by 2030 um, this is how it might look like. Um, with this, you know, this, especially that central part with the tram, um, just much more green. And then we also said um, if you look further, um, let's say 2070, um, then it might well be that we have less, less traffic uh, and then we can, in a way, bring the tram back into where the trams always used to be and that is sort of in the carriageway uh, and um, dedicate more space to, um, to um, yeah, sort of an ecosystem that is then in the middle of, the, uh, of, that, uh, of that street. Um, What's also, what we also found in this is also that when you have these big streets, it's really important also to start thinking about in modules. So it's kind of a module thinking. So what is there, what do we assume we need, um, you know, in 20, 30, 40 years? And, and, and um, what is in a way, you know, subject to change? And once you start designing like that, almost like modules uh, next to each other, you can also in a way decouple uh, different kinds of infrastructure from each other. So, because now the problem you often hear is, yeah, we cannot change the street profile because um, the sewer is here and um, if we have to sort of change that, then we have to redo the whole street. Now, if you kind of set it up in this sort of modules, then that becomes much easier if you have this kind of cutting line. So, you don't have to redo the whole street. You can just take out what, whatever, one lane and do something with it. Or you can, um, you know, uh, move a tram from one place to another place. So these, these kind of things are then uh, much easier and you have, don't have to sort of redo uh, everything in, in, in its entirety. Street lights is also an example, you know. They're very costly, they have foundations. They, so if you can put them in a place where you can be fairly, you're fairly safe in assuming that, you know, in, in 30, 50 years it will still be there, then actually it's a good investment. If you have to replace it or move it, in 20 years time, then it's probably less so. That were the streets uh, we looked at, but I thought, you know, I'll, I'll also show you another project, um, uh, and that's a park. Um, it's a park in uh, Shenzhen. Um, for those who don't know Shenzhen, uh, it's a city in the south of China, just bordering uh, Hong Kong. Um, I was there for the first time in 2004, and uh, back then it had I think 8 million inhabitants and now it has more than 20 million. So it was kind of a rapid growth of the city and not just uh, in terms of inhabitants, also in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, of size. Um, and 
Um, with that came also a transformation from an area that was relatively focused on agriculture to actually uh, a city. And uh, within that city, um, there was a place that was actually left over, a bit of an oddity, because um, this was actually built in the 1970s as an agricultural research center. Um, there was no city back then yet, yeah? so, but this is where they did, uh, did research. Um, you know, we saw also in the 80s sort of um, um, scientists from uh, experts visiting from, uh, from the West and uh, actually uh, also trying to learn uh, from uh, uh, Chinese forms of agriculture. Um, but in recent years that has not been uh, used anymore and it has really fallen into decline. And uh, when we started, basically this was uh, what we saw, basically an area that you know, lost, its, uh, lost its use, lost its function, um, but also an area that clearly had kind of the traces of this, this agricultural sort of research, you know, so uh, the, the greenhouses were basically destroyed or, or glasses broken, but a lot of the nature was actually, uh, was there, and of course, this has been, those trees have been planted, but they have been growing for 40 years there, you know, so they were actually, in a city like Shenzhen, it's very hard to find a tree like that uh, in that size, because um, all, most of them are, are much, much younger. So when we came there, we were in a way, you know, it was a bit of a kind of a sad place, but also actually quite, uh, quite amazing. And um, this was, was a competition uh, we did. Um, and um, this was basically the sort of three concepts we proposed in a competition. Um, so that area was completely fenced off. So we said, yeah, we, we, there is a city around it in the meantime, you have to imagine. So we actually have to sort of connect it to the city, make these links. Um, we, for us, it was clear from the beginning that we want to reuse as much as possible on that site because, uh, you know, especially not so much the buildings, but actually that the, 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 the green that had grown and evolved over time. Uh, and um, the last one was that we felt, yeah, there's also a need to sort of um, um, diversify things. Um, and then not so much diversify them necessarily in its aesthetic, but diversify them in terms of um, uh, use patterns, because um, what I said earlier, you know, if you design, because the goal was to design a park, but if you design a park, then of course, um, with all these demands that are kind of coming there, biodiversity, recreation, uh, water, st water treatment, uh, water storage, um, uh, etc., you actually have to, again, kind of think about how do, we, do I make sure that actually biodiversity has a place, you know, that animals actually can live there in, in, uh, in calmness when, you know, knowing that there's a city of like 25 million people sort of around it, you know, so how do we actually do that? That was a kind of a real sort of big challenge, you know, how can you create spaces that are very accessible and how are, is, are there places, you know, where in a way nobody goes or nobody can even go and I think that's also what we need to sort of think about when we talk about parks, that they're not only for people but they're also for all sorts of other species, whether that's plants or, or, or animals uh, equally. So what we did was um, from this, um, in a way, this zoning, uh, we created the zoning with uh, four different zones. Um, it was clear they wanted to have a sports program. We felt, okay, we have a sports zone. Um, and then there is a sort of a gra gra gradation from, you know, an artificial zone that is actually really activity, human activity, you know, playgrounds, these kind of things. Uh, a buffer zone that, in a way, can be the one or the other, and then really um, what we call the natural zone here uh, is really an area that is pretty much inaccessible for uh, for people, um, or it's not designed for people to uh, to to access it. And that was then sort of in a sort of a, a there was a beautiful lychee orchard that was still there. That's the the, the tree cover is basically this lychee orchard, uh, and these uh, these these trees I just showed you, the big ones. Uh, and then we added um, just a couple of, um, you know, um, elements to it, flowers, crops, um, and all of that together then uh, created a plan, um, a master plan, um, within which also the water and water retention was, uh, was really um, uh, a big issue. Um, so how can we create spaces that actually can store the water, um, but also spaces that, um, that are designed in such a way that um, you know, if it, it's nice if you have a lake, but if that lake is full, then it cannot take any water. So we were actually looking into how can we design spaces that um, are kind of water and a water surface and look nice, 
um, even with uh, sort of a low water level, so that when it rains, they can actually take a lot more water uh, uh, into it. And that was really sort of a land modeling uh, thing in the end to actually uh, create this with like a very, very shallow um, uh, edge. So it's not, you know, it's not a pond that needs a certain water level to look good. No, it's actually something where, um, you know, like, like high tide and low tide basically, and that, that tidal zone is actually has been carefully designed so it doesn't, you don't look on mud flats basically. So it, it, it was quite, quite, uh, quite a, a challenge to, to, get that, uh, to get that good. For plants, we um, actually um, um, was the first time I worked with an ecologist that was really great and he knew everything about a local guy, he knew everything about plants and we took a tour with him and he just basically um, kind of explained us, you know, what kind of plants we're actually seeing and what plants actually are local and what plants are sort of imported from elsewhere. And we just said, okay, let's only use local plants and let's, let's use the plants that actually in a way create uh, the maximum of biodiversity uh, in this place on top of the trees that we pretty much all of them uh, actually kept as lychee trees. And that was actually the substance we started um, sort of designing with um, and I was talking about you know how can you actually design zones of access or non-access so we created this this kind of real borders where people can, you know, where it's much harder to, uh, to cross. There is sort of trenches in there. There's partially walls. So things that, in a way, are obstacles where you cannot just, you know, climb. I mean, you can do that, of course. If you really want to get in, then you can. But it is kind of, you know, in a soft way, people are being told, and without fences, people are being told, you know, this is a zone where you can walk, where you can be, where you can enjoy yourself. And then there's another zone where actually you're, you're kind of, you're not so welcome, uh, let's say. Architecture also played a role. The program asked for um, a sports center, um, um, but then also a series of um, yeah, functional buildings um, that I think fitted quite, uh, quite nicely. Um, there was an old tea house um, that was to be transformed into a welcome center, uh, and there was, um, they wanted to have a, a library, or like you could say an education center around sustainable behavior, about sustainable, um, a sustainable lifestyle, for, for especially for kids and city dwellers. Uh, and the last one was a wedding chapel. Um, it was also kind of, uh, uh, kind of a nice mix. Uh, we did two of the buildings. Um, uh, one is actually that library. Um, so this is the natural zone. Um, and um, kind of counterintuitively we said, okay, we, this is where we actually want to put, uh, put that library. But the library actually is, is, uh, is only accessible via this, uh, this, uh, this path, which is actually over the treetops. So in a way, uh, that there was a clearing, that's where we put the library, and then uh, you actually have to, you can basically only see the forest, but you can actually not get, uh, uh, get into it. Uh, there's only a little access, uh, service access from the road going there, but for the rest, um, it's, it's not accessible other than through this, uh, through this elevated uh, bridge. And in that natural zone also everything is actually sort of designed or non-designed, you know. So this is, this is actually a path, what you see here in that, in that zone, yeah. So um, it's also actually only really accessible during the season when you can harvest the lychee. So then people are actually allowed to, to actually go in there. So it's not that, that, you know, there's a central management. No, people that visit the park can actually go there and kind of collect their own lychees. But that's only in that part of the season for the rest actually uh, that zone is, uh, is off limits to just keep, you know, nature more or less, uh, uh, let nature do its own, uh, its own thing. So here this is uh, how the library actually lands on the ground and this is that, uh, that access uh, path. Um, it kind of typically sits sort of on top of, the, of, the, of that hill and, uh, you know, if this is the view you also know why we actually like to place it there. Um, so you have this sort of enormous uh, view across uh, the, the skyline of, uh, of, uh, of Shenzhen. As I said, there's a sports zone where we actually try to, you know, also keep it as compact as possible uh, so that there is actually more space for green. And then I was talking about that buffer zone and this is how that buffer zone is actually um, uh, designed. Now this is China, so um, they wanted to, it to have, you know, sort of a, kind of a garden-like uh, uh, atmosphere. Um, uh, but nevertheless, there is actually uh, sort of islands in that that are really sort of 
specially designed for, uh, for biodiversity. Um, and then we get into the artificial zone. Um, so this was actually an object that was uh, left over from, a, from a, an entertainment park that was on the corner of that research center. And we thought, actually, it's quite beautiful. Let's, uh, let's keep it there. Um, added the sort of, you know, the, the, the typical sort of kids play space, a bit of uh, uh, sportscapes. And what we also had there was um, that welcome center. So this was an old tea house that we completely uh, renovated. And now it's a welcome center on the ground floor and a restaurant on top. And yeah, with that I kind of feel, you know, that I mean, what we were really surprised when, uh, when, when, when we heard that that park actually was the most Instagrammed uh, um, that view from that, uh, from that library for a while was the most uh, uh, Instagrammed or like in China it's WeChat uh, um, um, location in the whole of, uh, in the whole of Shenzhen. Um, and, but I think it also shows that, um, you know, if you design a park, um, I think we have to sort of think much more about how we bring all these things together and not only deal with, you know, what we as humans find aesthetically appealing and also not only kind of focus on, you know, what helps us, what serves us, but also uh, in a way, you know, kind of preserve things uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a certain way, not just for us, but for, you know, future generations and also for, um, for other uh, species. And I have a little film and we made this for, there was a sort of... Um, um, Beijing Design Week, and uh, the Dutch government wanted to use this as a sort of a promotion of, um, I'm not Dutch, but I mean, it doesn't matter. Um, um, my colleagues, we have Dutch are the minority in the office, but still we count as a Dutch office, and they wanted to use that as a sort of promotional film. And um, we actually, uh, my colleagues went to the park and just interviewed random people they met. So nothing, um, even though you think sometimes it's actually staged, this is not choreographed. This is just the statements that uh, that were collected there. So, I went to the park once. This place I have the most impression is that it is used to use the original stone 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 图书馆往下看的时候，然后在岭上上面走的时候，也有一种就是在树顶上面走的感觉，就是给人一种不一样的感觉。不一样的就是它跟公园有机结合了，然后它又能观景作为一个观景平台，还有可以作为一个图书馆的这种公共活动性的这种空间，然后能满足这个游客的多方面的需求。我还是很喜欢这片这个呃荔枝园和龙眼树这个树林这个地方，因为呢，这里呢，包括夏天很热的时候啊，走到这里都会觉得很凉快。尤其在城市里头，在我们这个市中心里头看到这片绿色，我觉得特别好。Good, that's what the visitors think. And, oops, I don't know what she thinks, but、um, I'm sure she's also going to use it. In the future. Thank you. I hope you have questions or comments. Thank you very much. This, this is really, it was really very interesting and very nice. And also to really talk about that kind of question of the in between and the build and the unbuild, and especially the unbuild.、Um, and I think this is something we discussed also earlier. Even in the German, what we discussed, and you told me when you came, and you, you walked from the station here to the university, and he said, you know, what kind of streetscapes are here around? Kind of, there's hardly a tree. Kind of, you have tarmac, tarmac everywhere.、Um, wow,、well, and also in the Netherlands, kind of, so there's not that much, much tarmac. Kind of, there's a lot of kind of stones. I think we, you really are speaking from my heart, and we really have to look to build our uh, our specific, and really look to landscape in between nature and really the world. And but I never had it so much in mind. This kind of we have so many roots because we are talking the last semester about kind of you can expropriate people for infrastructure, you cannot expropriate them for green and blue infrastructure at the moment. But what I found very impressive. So many roots for buildings, and we have also this unfortunate situation of Stegelbaum, which I really like to eliminate because it's.
talking about buildings, and it's not about building. Urban design and urban planning is not only about building, and we can focus so much on, on, on that aspect. Yeah. Good. Machen wir es auf Deutsch? Ja, gerne. Ja. Gut. Ja. Um, uh, it's a good question. <laughs> How many hours do you have? Uh, no, uh, I mean, first, first, Chinese perception of space is different. Um, I also once wrote a, wrote a text about the meaning of walls and gates in China. Um, and um, in, 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 a Ch in Chinese society, actually, what creates meaning is walls and gates. So if you want to have a place of meaning, it has to have a gate. You have to go through a gate to actually arrive in a place. Um, that means that in con you know, the, the, the space outside the gate, outside the wall, actually is, is, is not really a place of, uh, of meaning for many Chinese. So that, that's what it was in the past. Um, that's also when it comes to this park. So um, um, I didn't show it now, but um, it has actually a series of these quite you know, elaborate gate situations. So they're not, we kind of refrain from doing you know, the classical Chinese gates, but it's clearly you know, this sort of transition from being sort of in the city of going into the park. So that, that, is, uh, that is different. Uh, when it comes to, and then there is, um, in, in Chinese landscape architecture, there is um, a, a whole series of very, very interesting sort of low impact concepts. So for example, um, um, they use that idea of the borrowed scenery. So you're, you're kind of, it's part of when you design a park, actually what's around it is something you sort of integrate into, into the design but you don't touch it, you know? Or if you touch it, it's maybe just a little pagoda somewhere sitting on a, on a hilltop. Uh, it's a quite, quite an intriguing um, sort of concept, which is very, in a way, uh, different from what, what we often have here, where we think, you know, we have to design everything. No, there is really much more about, you know, understanding what is there and, and um, framing then views. And that's also, for example, when you're not, not talking about parks, but Chinese gardens, they're, they're exactly working with that principle. So typically, they appear much bigger than they are because you're walking through them and you get completely disoriented. So in the end, you look at the same piece of rock from five different angles and you, every time you think you're actually seeing something you haven't seen before. And it's just the views that are, uh, same with the buildings. There is like, buildings are not, um, it's kind of a, a continuum, continuum of buildings where the landscapes in a way block views. And in the end, it's just you realize actually on the plan it is one big building, but I never perceived it uh, like that. So that is, there is a different perception. Um, I have to say um, when it comes to climate change adaptation, um, um, for example, um, actually it was the Chinese that invented that term, sponge city, for example. Um, um, there is an enormous um, investment also going on from the side of the Chinese government in actually uh, really tackling the effects of, uh, of climate change. And in these big cities, of course, you know, I mean, Vienna is a big city and Amsterdam is a big city, but this is a whole different uh, uh, category of uh, scale. Um, uh, also means when a disaster strikes there, actually a lot more people are affected. And this is what the Chinese government I'm not saying they're doing this out of altruism or because they're fans of it. It's to, to a degree, it's also out of fear um, that, that something could, uh, could happen. And there's enormous amounts they're investing. They're investing in, um, and we're doing five river projects in Shenzhen right now, sort of re-naturalizing uh, rivers just to reduce the flood, um, the, 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 the flood risk in, uh, in many places. Um, they're um, also um, um, starting to realize that uh, over this quick urban growth, um, you know, the, the, the natural systems, the, the, the green grids actually have been broken. So there is, um, there is also enormous programs to, to, in a way, reconnect what is left as green space into much bigger uh, green spaces. So, I mean, when it comes to that, I think um, it's really worth uh, actually looking closely if you're interested, because uh, I think there is a lot you can learn from uh, for, the, for the context here, uh, I have to say. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's also one of the reasons why I'm still fascinated working in China because I saw this. I, I started, first project I did in China was 20 years ago. Um, 
and um, there you really had the feeling you know, that they are lagging behind what's happening in, in Europe. But over these 20 years, actually the distance, um, uh, the time lag has become shorter and shorter, and now it's at least on the same level, and I think there's also cases where they're really sort of heading the way. Um, also, I mean, this is now more architectural, when it comes to sort of um, greening um, uh, of buildings, green roofs is just, you know, it, we have like, we cannot do buildings anymore that, that don't have green roofs, for example. It's just, you know, so that there's all these things are actually happening at a much, much bigger, much, much bigger pace. So. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's basically a regulation. Yeah. And you have to do it. And of course, if you have to do it, then, uh, then um, um, you also start thinking of, you know, can it be more than just, you know, extensive greening, for example? You know, can it be a roof garden? Can it be part of, uh, I mean, the nice thing in Shenzhen is the weather is, you know, it's always so warm that you can basically, when you have a roof over your head, you can be outside all year round. So, uh, but then they have developed entirely new working environments. I mean, I'm we're working often with a company that they have an office building and that office building there is basically two floors missing and this is actually where you have the meeting rooms but the meeting room is basically a forest and you're sitting on a, on a, on a you know, garden table in a forest and this is where you have your meeting. So, so I mean, there is, there is people really then want to make something special out of it and I think, um, that's, I think it wouldn't be the case if it wasn't, wasn't regulated that you have to do it, but because you have to do it, actually, uh, they try to make more out of it. <coughs> Does it answer your question? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Fragen. Fragen. Yeah. In which one? Sorry? In which project? Um, I mean, the first one I showed you was actually is a study we did sort of in the office. Um, so that was just for ourselves to get, an, get a grip and understand ourselves what it is. Uh, we, are, we actually um, we have presented it to some people in the city administration and um, there will be another presentation uh, soon to talk about it uh, um, uh, more. Um, but it's not, it's not that there's no public consultation involved in, in that. And <coughs> in the other case, um, um, no, there was no public consultation, um, um, but um, yeah, it doesn't exist as, a, as an institute in the Chinese context. Um, but that doesn't mean you cannot involve people in, uh, in doing things. So we also did other projects where we basically just uh, invited people for, for workshops, um, landowners, uh, people from the local community, uh, and worked with them just without you know, the <laughs> official label of public consultation. So you can do that, but in this case, it hasn't, uh, hasn't happened. Questions there? Yeah. Yeah. Also, nee, wir, haben, wir haben jetzt nicht die Feuerwehr gefragt, ob das, äh, das so ist. Ähm, ich glaube auch nicht, dass die Straßenräume so aussehen müssen, wie sie aussehen, weil die Feuerwehr irgendwie mit ihrer, mit ihrer Drehleiter dann noch irgendwas äh, ähm, machen muss. Also da, da hat's, das hat natürlich einen Impact, aber, aber, ähm, aber das ist nicht der einzige Grund. Ähm, man muss natürlich auch sagen, ähm, ähm, wenn man jetzt das vergleicht, was da jetzt da ist und das, was, was wir vorschlagen, das ist, was wir vorschlagen, ist teurer, das erstmal. Ja, das muss das, und häufig sind es einfach auch Budgetfragen. Äh, Auf der anderen Seite, wenn wir uns über Klimawandel unterhalten, dann, ähm, dann, dann verschiebt sich so ein bisschen die Budgetüberlegung. Ja, dann ist, 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 ähm, ist es vielleicht jetzt billiger, aber die Kosten von, äh, von äh, Überflutung, von, ähm, von ähm, ja, Umweltproblemen, von Überhitzung und so weiter, die sind natürlich viel, viel höher als, als das, was man letztendlich hier dann irgendwie extra investieren, äh, investieren müsste. Also ich glaube, das ist, das ist eher der Grund. Äh, der zweite ist, 
und das ist, kommt, irgendwie auch, kommt wirklich auch aus der Geschichte, wer designt Straßen? Ja? Also in den meisten Ländern werden Straßen einfach von Ingenieuren gezeichnet, ähm, St Straßen, die, die einfach irgendwie ihren, ihren Code haben und, 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 und der wird irgendwie angewendet. Ja? Also das, das zeichnen keine Landschaftsarchitekten äh, Straßenquerschnitte ja? und das, so sieht es dann entsprechend auch aus. Und äh, ich glaube, da sieht man auch einen Unterschied zwischen, oder ich sehe da einen Unterschied auch zwischen verschiedenen äh, Ländern. In den Niederlanden ist dieses, ist dieses integrierte Denken ist, ist schon, ist noch nicht super, aber es ist schon weiterentwickelt, als es, als es jetzt zum Beispiel in Deutschland der Fall ist. Ich finde, wenn ich in Deutschland bin, die deutschen Straßen immer unglaublich grau und hart und irgendwie, äh, und wenn ich in Niederlanden bin, denke ich so, ja, was machen die eigentlich anders? Und äh, das zum einen ist es grün, zum anderen ist es aber auch, die, die Wahl der Materialien ist irgendwie eine andere, und die, wie die Details äh, letztendlich äh, auch gemacht werden. In Deutschland sind die Straßen alle irgendwie, die Details sind einfach so gemacht, dass du überall ohne Probleme mit, mit, äh, mit dem LKW äh, durchfahren kannst. Das ist in den Niederlanden nicht so, weil die Städte einfach auch, oder viele der Städte einfach auch äh, ganz anders äh, äh, entstanden sind, ganz anders gewachsen sind. Ja, in Deutschland gibt es kaum noch äh, mittelalterliche Städte, die sind alle im Zweiten Weltkrieg, die meisten zerstört worden und dann wurden in den 50er, 60er Jahren über autogerechte Städte äh, äh, gebaut ähm, und, ähm, und in Niederlanden gibt es das nicht, wo es die, die Stadt, zumindest die Kerne meistens alte Städte sind. Ja, oder so Rasensteine geht ja oder auch. Ja. Die Frauen haben einen gewissen Abstand von den Häusern, die dürfen nicht da zu nah ran, das können sie ja. nicht anderen. Das würde alles funktionieren mit diesem System. Und ich glaube, das Problem ist eigentlich viel eher, dass man also in den, also in den Niederlanden finde ich, glaube ich, dass viele, viele Flächen eben nicht asphaltiert, weil man das auch zwischen Bankboden und Bahnboden nicht richtig kann. Oder weil es einfach noch aufwendiger ist. Aber ich glaube, die Straßen wollen schon alle planen. Ja, und ich denke, ich denk, also 
wenn du sagst Parken, also in Amsterdam zum Beispiel hat die Stadt beschlossen, dass sie 10.000 Parkplätze abbauen. Ja, ähm, und das machen sie aber jetzt nicht alles in einem Aufwasch, sondern das machen sie so ja, ein bisschen, heim, bisschen heimlich. Ja, so die verschwinden so nach und nach, so, so, so in homöopath, homöopathischen Dosen. Und so kann man das natürlich auch machen. Ja, so, ähm, ähm, und und ähm, ich glaube, äh, naja, das, das, die zwei Faktoren, dass es irgendwie extrem sag mal, aus der Architektur gedacht ist und das andere auch irgendwie so... so die Straße immer noch, glaube ich, im deutschsprachigen Raum immer noch so ein, so ein Kunstwerk der Ingenieurskunst irgendwie äh, ist. Ähm, ich glaube, das, das ist in den Niederlanden sicher anders. Also da, ja, da wird da anders irgendwie, das wird anders. Ja. Natürlich. Gibt es auch, klar. Gibt es auch, aber da gibt es natürlich die, die was natürlich, da gibt es die Kultur des, des, des Polderns. Und die kommt wirklich, ich weiß nicht, ob ihr das kennt, das, also in Niederlanden gibt es ja die ganzen Deiche. Ja, und das, ist das Schöne an einem Deich ist ja, der hält ja das Wasser draußen. Aber wenn, wir das, wenn ich auf meinem Grundstück einen Deich baue, der irgendwie und den Unterhalt und mein Nachbar irgendwie ähm, hat auf seinem Grundstück auch ein Stück Deich und der unterhält ihn nicht und der Deich bricht, dann habe ich auch nasse Füße. Äh, und das ist irgendwie, das ist ganz tief in, in diesem holländischen Denken drin, dass man, dass man, dass es letztendlich gesellschaftlichen Konsens finden muss und dass man es auch irgendwie zusammen und integriert irgendwie machen muss, weil man sonst wirklich nasse Füße kriegt. Ne? Ähm, ähm, ja. Air traffic. We see already like a lot of drones being used, you know, for deliveries, etc. And it might happen, this is just, you know, at the moment it's like a fantasy world, but we might be also traveling with small vehicles going through the air and no one will be Straße. I think there will be a degree of air traffic, but I don't think, I don't believe so much in, uh, in individual uh, personal traffic through the air in cities. Uh, I think that will be, and it's already there, for like things that need to be speedy, whatever, medications, uh, uh, these kind of things. Uh, but, and actually, as a matter of fact, um, cities that have less well-developed infrastructure are much further in that already than uh, the cities here. Um, but I, I don't think it's gonna, gonna be for humans. Um, there is also, when we talk about you know, climate change and carbon footprint. Actually, transporting people through the air just needs a lot more energy than transporting ourselves on the ground. Uh, and I think that is another another reason why I don't think there will be sort of a mass uh, phenomenon that we're all going to have our little flying taxi. Uh, to be honest. But I mean, I said other cities are much further. For example, I know that the city of Bogota is actually developing um, an air-based transport system because they have a lot of these uh, informal settlements that actually have no infrastructure. So for like things like uh, you know um, medication, but also um, they want to. You know, there's also almost no retail in, this, uh, in, in, in a lot of these, uh, in these informal settlements. And there they are thinking of actually really kind of having air-based uh, delivery to these almost inaccessible uh, places. Uh, 
Um, so, uh, you know, it, there is, huh? Yeah, I mean, these slums, they basically, they are usually on very steep hills. Um, there is no, no infrastructure, um, but you can also not service that. So, um, or when somebody is ill, you know, you cannot get these people away. And for that, they actually provide developing this, uh, this air-based transport system. A bit what you also have in, in the mountains, you know, that these huts actually get served with, uh, with helicopters. But then in this case, it's actually uh, um, drones. And they're not these ones there. Then just like they can carry like up to 500 kilos. So quite big. So that happens already. And I think, you know, especially for these kinds of places, um, it, it can be an answer, you know, but, uh, but I don't think we need it in, in the cities here, really. Yeah. So what was your question? I didn't get the first part. Is the car, car, car reduction? Car yeah. Reduction? Yeah, I hear you. Is the car reduction uh, to offer on good public transport or car yeah. trains or to hard regulation? Of this, is this is this is uh, important parameter in this? It is. Um, I, I, I mean. I, Personally, I believe there will, I mean, we see this now that, 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 um, that there is more car sharing and I guess there will be even more car sharing in the future um, for two reasons. One is that I think, one is the environmental consciousness, but the other I think is also, is, are also economic considerations that cars just have become very, very expensive. And if I look at, um, if I look at um, simply uh, ownership of, um, of um, uh, driver's licenses, uh, then uh, it's really staggering to see how, how um, that has dropped uh, over one generation in the same age group. So um, in, in the Netherlands, actually, like um, 20 years ago, that age group between 18 and, and 29 actually had, had um, about 75% had a driver's license. Now it's only 40%. And of course, when we talk about car sharing, then you need to have a driver's license. That is kind of your entry ticket. If you don't have that, then, uh, uh, then, then um, you, you don't drive. Uh, so car sharing, in a way, um, uh, is not even for that. I think we see more public transport. We see more car sharing. Uh, and, um, and I think, um, um, yeah, there's also, also other new means of, uh, of transport. I mean, the whole microelectric uh, mobility. Yeah? Um, I mean, when I have to transport something in Rotterdam, I'm typically, like, really, like, you know, not, not move house, but, uh, but uh, transport whatever, something bigger, then I typically just get uh, uh, an uh, electric cargo bike from, uh, from the street and, uh, and uh, use it. I don't drive anymore because, um, you know, parking is expensive if there is a parking place at all. Um, you in because they kind of reduce the amount of streetscape for cars, you kind of largely in traffic jams, so what's the point of, uh, of doing that? So their cities are also structurally making it less interesting to, uh, to, uh, to drive by car. And I mean, Amsterdam is even is, is more extreme than, Rotterdam is still a relatively car-friendly city. In Amsterdam, it's just, you know, nobody drives anymore. I mean, you know, you pay 80 euros for, uh, for 10 hours of parking in the city center. Um, I mean, then, and uh, that, that limits, you know, the, the, the use of cars. So I think, um, but of course, you know, to, for people to be able to switch, we also need to provide uh, viable alternatives. And that's why I also believe actually all these other forms of mobility and public transport have to, have to be developed further and have to have uh, higher capacity and better service. Especially here, also that kind of there's a city 
public transport, but it's not drawn further. And the allowance of cars and the, the availability of very, very cheap parking places here in the city. When I came kind of two years ago, I was quite amazed how many cars are in that city. And if I listen then to the kind of model split I got get from the statistics of the Wiener Union, then I cannot believe it. But there are cars kind of in that city that are not in that equation, not in that calculation. And I saw another kind of graph not so long ago about the commuters coming into um, into the city of Vienna. It's amazing how far people drive daily into that city. And this is the kind of the problem, let's say, kind of mm. in that at the, at the moment. If this is getting more expensive, and if there is a kind of a network kind of that really allows these people to commute into the city with public transport, then they would change. This one is the same kind of in, in the city. The city of Zurich kind of would collapse completely. They would not, the city would not be able to digest the amount of people that come daily in the city because they just don't have the street for it. It's pretty simple. Um, so we only change that very often kind of when there is really a necessity kind of because it's collapsing. Uh, and we have to, <coughs> to change it now because of another collapse we have in front of our nose. Yeah, and I, I also think there is, there is you, can, you can also, of course, support it. I mean, there was this example now in Germany with this, uh, this nine euro uh, ticket that you could use basically um, public transport for nine euros. Of course, that, that kind of totally, uh, totally kind of brought public transport at the brink of capacity um, uh, or collapse. And um, in a way, that is a problem. But on the other hand, you also see that if you make things economically attractive, then people are also, um, you know, willing to at least try. I mean, it doesn't mean that they will always do it, but, you know, if, if you know, uh, five out of ten times they don't use a car, but but uh, but a but a train, then you've all, you know, it's already 50% less. And I think that is that is um, um, is also sometimes just a matter of uh, of you know um, um, doing it. So you know, we always have this. In German, wo ein Wille ist, ist auch ein Weg. Um, um, I more often think actually it's it's more and more the other way around. So wo ein Weg ist, dann ist auch, ist auch ein Wille. Yeah? So first we have to kind of create something, and then people will actually uh, sort of do it. So uh, with all these these fundamental and drastic changes, um, um, the will typically is always lagging behind. Um, um, you know, what we actually need to do. So I think we just have to turn it around and just yeah, say, okay, we're going to do it and then you want it, you know, so. I think we are re really very lazy and we go always the way of the least, let's say, effort to a certain extent, but if you make this comfortable and um, affordable, I think people will use it. And it's good we also know that we take longer, longer distances if, if, if the, way, the, 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 the way we have to go is really attractive. Um, it's also, there are so many, let's say, parameters in this equation kind of we just need to uh, take into account if we can. And it's not only about the time distance, it's also what we, what we are able to see, what we are able to do on that kind of part where we really can really do. Um, and I, I had a client in Paris kind of when we were working there kind of who was always kind of very, very surprised why I'm coming by train. And when I kind of came for the, let's say, the, the, the opening of the building, I had to, I had to go back and say, oh, I have to really check kind of when trains are on. No, no, I can't tell you when the train is on. I said, oh, what do you mean? I'm traveling between Paris and Europe now by train because it's much more kind of time-wise, it's better, I can work on the train, I don't need to wait somewhere. So let's say people change if they see that it's more convenient and attractive. But it's also kind of, let's say, the train connections are also much better, you know, kind of if you, the, the time, time-wise, it's nearly the same taking the train there for this distance, and there are other distances we cannot manage, but I think inner European connections, a lot of inner country connections we can handle by train. Well, that was a long answer for your question. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else had a question here still, no? What was that? And then let me say hand. Yeah. Here, noch, here, noch, here, noch, here, noch.
you mentioned um, that uh, your that the study you did about the city, uh, the trees in Rotterdam was just a study. I thought yeah. it was a project. No. So No, we, we, we presented it once to a couple of people uh, there, and we're going to have another presentation, um, um, I think it's somewhere beginning of next year, it's, uh, it's scheduled, just to... How did they react, like, like, or how is it in, in, in Rotterdam, like, or like who, who would pay for this? You know? Well, I mean, luckily I was talking to, to urban planners, so they're usually not, <laughs> not, not, going, not about the money, um, um, <laughs> luckily. Um, <laughs> I mean, no, but, but uh, I mean, th th again, this was for, for us was, I mean, why we did it was in the first place was for us to, to sort of understand ourselves what it is we should be, uh, we should be doing, you know, um, and, um, um, and over that actually learning, you know, um, what, we, what we can do. Um, um, and when we presented to the city, they, they found it very interesting, but of course there were, you know, some of these questions, um, you know, how do we do those transport? And of course, is, isn't it too complex and too complicated? Um, at the same time, they also said, you know, it really kind of also is an eye opener to us that there is a, that there is a whole bunch of things we never thought about that we actually also need to need to look at. Yeah. So the suggestion, for example, to to combine or compress utilities into into in a way sort of a, 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 a kind of a tunnel, you could say, where you can put all of this in. Um, um, just to, to, to release space for other things. For example, that is something they found very interesting. And uh, in the context of that, they also said, yeah, maybe there is even a business model behind it. Because so far, all, everybody who puts stuff in the ground, all these utilities companies, they actually don't pay for the fact that they use public space to put their utilities. It's just that they get, they get the right to put it in, and then uh, and that's it. So they have to pay for you know, digging it open, putting it in, and closing it again. But once it's in there, it's basically, um, they don't pay rent for it. At the same time, you know, it's a, they are making basically money on, 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 on the public realm, on utilities. So then they said, yeah, maybe if we built this sort of, if we formalize that and build a tunnel, and then um, basically we could rent out space to, uh, to them in this, in this uh, building structure then, basically. So that could also, for example, be a source of income to actually pay for, for other improvements you want to do uh, in the street. That was for a really interesting discussion. We didn't think about it, but I think, why not, actually? Yeah, exactly. That's the big we problem. Don't put yeah. it underneath the, where the cars pass. No. You know, the cars could get disturbed. If yeah, exactly. We yeah. Need to yeah. Get, uh, yeah. Open again. Uh, so we was was just doing like this utility thing and, and, and tunnel as well, and everybody was like, oh no, 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 no way too expensive, you know. So yeah. you know, like also the transformation of these trees into that is a big, big step. But yeah. uh, yeah, I mean, th that, that's it, but on, on the other hand, you say, okay, there is no, that's where we want to put trees, you know? Okay, this is still like this condition where I say, okay, trees are optional. But if we talk about heat island and climate change, actually a more porous open surface and trees are not optional anymore. They're as much an infrastructure as your sewer pipe and your electricity line. And, and then you have to, in a way, if you have to redistribute that, that underground space, then, you know, it might be the consequence that yeah, it's more expensive, but you know, we still uh, do it. You know, I mean, when we build buildings, when we make them higher, at some point you also have to provide a lift. That's also more expensive than uh, than stairs. And still, it's it's just you have to do it. You know, it's um, um, I think yeah, it, it's just kind of finding that point where where the pressure just becomes uh, uh, or the, the necessity in a way um, sort of uh, becomes bigger than the cost in a way. And then, then I think you can actually make it happen. I find it completely rightful, and then the cities should have input from it. But I think uh, the customers would immediately get the price change, and it wouldn't mm -hmm. get to. So the companies wouldn't pay for it, they would charge extra than what the customers. 
Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some now. I mean, uh, of course, they, it costs more. On the other hand, if you if you your maintenance also gets simpler. You know, if you have a tunnel where you don't have to dig up up because what they typically have to do when they replace something, they have to open the pay for opening the road, fixing the thing, and closing the road again. And in Holland, this is typically this kind of concrete blocks that's not even so expensive. But if you have tarmac, then actually it's you know, and you have to rebuild the road. It's a bit it's a bit more of an issue. So so in a way, their maintenance could also become uh, become uh, 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 cheaper. You know, so so it's not it doesn't mean that all the costs for this would be have to be offset onto uh, onto onto others. Um, um, but in the other, on the other hand, I still think it's kind of interesting that that you can just occupy a lot of space and you don't have to pay for it, you know, it's just... Uh, yeah. And there is another aspect, I think we all know kind of the, uh, at least the ones kind of at, uh, from Vienna, kind of, uh, that this kind of square at the Eustatia kind of has this big discussion around it, we did not have really enough green and not enough trees and had to change. What was very interesting to see, because that's very often the case also, kind of, because there is not this necessity or that is how do you see piping kind of appearing in the ground is very often hilarious. Yeah, and true. also big maps, kind of what was there in the ground, and therefore it was very, very tricky to, let's say, build, to, to, to integrate other trees. And this whole underground world, um, if it is better sorted, you know, and it's better organized and planned, because maybe it has to be, or there's another one that says, maybe we just don't get this corridor, you know, we need it for something else, then I think it's also, because there's also, I, I, I think that once in Ireland kind of they put the piping into the garage, the garage right there, you also can do it like that. Yeah, you know? in Hungary, the planning for utility lines is so imprecise, it only has to match a few meters in yeah. the yes. so it's running somewhere. But that's, that honestly, that's the case almost everywhere. And I mean, you know, I mean, most, a lot of cities don't even know where their pipes are on the ground. Um, I know there is a company from Switzerland now, they developed a scanning system where they do with sort of little, they're creating little earthquakes, and then with seismic kind of scans, they can then basically create an underground model of, uh, of the pipe work. Um, because, and they do this in London now, because in London the city has absolutely no clue. I mean, this is like the infrastructure partially is like 200 years old. There is, you know, um, um, and, and then it's anyway the question, you know, then you draw plans, but often it just, they just do it a bit, a bit different, you know. So, um, so in the UK when you do a building, for example, you have to, you're designing a building, you have to do construction drawings. But when the building is finished, you actually have to hand a set of drawings with as built uh, to yes. the authorities. Because, yeah. because yeah. you know, a lot of things actually even change after construction drawings are basically uh, drawn. So, and the same is with utilities, you know. And if that happens over, whatever, five generations or six, yeah, I mean, nobody knows anymore what's, 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 what's done in there. So, um, that might also be an incentive to actually clean up a bit and, in a way, reduce also the loss, because what you also see is that all these old systems, they actually, they are kind of actually leaking quite a bit, especially sewer, sewer pipes are, are just, you know, I mean, you have a loss of like 20% of the water, 30% of the water just going somewhere. And so it would actually also be better for the environment to do that. And if you have this tunnel, of course, you immediately see when there is, a, when there is somewhere a sort of a leakage or something. But yeah, I mean, Thank you. It was brilliant. It was good.